Hey, what's going on, AP World? We have Alan Brinkley's American History Chapter 2 review video for you today, Transplantations and Borderlands. So we're into colonial America. Let's get going. All right, we're going to talk about the early Chesapeake. But first thing we need to understand is what exactly is the Chesapeake. And the Chesapeake is considered part of the South or Southern colonies and is made up of two specific colonies, Virginia and Maryland. So we have Virginia here, Maryland over here, and you'll notice right here in the middle is a Chesapeake Bay. So although the Chesapeake is a part of the South, it only constitutes two colonies, Virginia and Maryland. Now, in Virginia, there was a settlement in Jamestown, and this was founded in 1607. This was the first permanent English settlement. Remember, Roanoke was founded earlier, but it was not permanent. It was a charter colony, which meant that individuals would get together and pool their money, and they would share in the profits and losses of the colony together. So the whole purpose was to hopefully make money. In the winter of 1609 to 1610, there was a time period that was known as a starving time because many people died. They were very sick and there were high death rates. John Smith, one of the leaders of Jamestown, helped save the colony from starvation. And he had a famous quote, he who shall not work shall not eat. So really encouraged people of the colony to work together to flourish. Now let's talk about tobacco because tobacco is going to be hugely important in the Chesapeake region. It was introduced by John Rolfe who later goes on to marry Pocahontas. However, it was hated by King James I. He called it an evil weed and there is John Rolfe. Tobacco made lots of money for the colonists. However, it exhausted the land which led to expansion. So tobacco really, really after a couple years just decimated the land and forced the colonists to begin to move further west where natives were living and this would lead to conflict with the natives and this would be an endless cycle. They would use up that land because of the tobacco and continue moving out west. Right, let's talk about expansion. We have something called the head right system. Be very familiar with both as multiple choice questions and poten potential essay info. What it is is 50 acres of land. So every new settler that would come over was given 50 acres of land. However, if a rich landowner in colonial America paid the passage of an immigrant or an indentured servant to come over, they would receive 50 acres of land. So it really encouraged indentured servants and it helped reward wealthy individuals. In the year 1619, there are two very important events. The first one is the House of Burgesses, which were elected representatives in Virginia, is the earliest form of representative government in the United States. This happens in 1619, and also, and there's the Virginia House of Burgesses, and also the first group of Africans arrive in colonial America. So slavery begins to be introduced in this year. It's kind of ironic that those two events happen in the same year. Conflict with the natives, let's talk about, we have Powhatan Confederacy, and by 1644, after some conflict with the colonists and the natives, they're no longer a threat. All right, let's dive a little deeper into Maryland. It was founded by the second Lord Baltimore, and it fared better than the early Virginians did. We have something called the Maryland Acts of Toleration, and please commit this to memory. It's very, very important when we're talking about religious freedom in colonial America. It granted freedom of worship to all Christians, and this was specifically designated to Catholics. However, we're going to notice this word Christians here. It is not, it does not grant freedom to Jews, for example. If you were not a Christian, you could be put to death in Maryland. So there were heavy, heavy punishments if you were not Christian. However, if you were, you were free to practice your religion. In Virginia in 1776, one of the most important events in colonial America happens, and that's Bacon's Rebellion. We have this guy, Governor Berkeley, who was trying to control things in Jamestown. So he's telling settlers, you cannot settle west of this line. He like draws a line and says, you can't go west there. He was worried about conflict with the native. However, in the west, many farmers underrepresented in the House of Burgesses, and they felt that their needs weren't being met. And they also felt that they weren't being protected from natives by Governor Berkeley. So here's Nathaniel Bacon. He's got a beef. Get it? Bacon? Beef? I know, Courtney. And he's like, yo, don't tell me where to go, buddy. You need to offer adequate protection. So he goes on a rebellion with many other poor landless whites, and he almost takes control. However, he dies suddenly of a disease. So what is the significance? Why do we care about Bacon's Rebellion? And any essay that talks about slavery from colonial America has to include this. This is a movement towards slaves for labor. 
Many of these people who were revolting were former indentured servants who were given their freedom. So rich landowners in Virginia decide we just simply will no longer use indentured servants because they have to get their freedom. This is a shift towards slavery. You need to know this, guys. I cannot stress this enough. This also shows tensions between the rich and the poor and the east and west, meaning the eastern wealthy people like Governor Berkeley and the west underrepresented people. You'll see this theme a lot throughout American history. Okay, we're going to go up north to New England, and Plymouth was founded by the pilgrims who were separatists who wanted to completely break away from the Anglican Church or the Church of England. On the right over, they formed the Mayflower Compact, which established a government led by majority rule. So whatever, is, whatever most people decide will go. The relations with the natives uh, in New England is a little different. Many natives had died before most of the colonists came over. Um, however, the natives that remained, they in the beginning had a pretty good relationship with them. The natives taught colonists how to farm and how to hunt. And be able to recognize this name, William Bradford, he was the governor of Plymouth. Let's talk about the Puritans. Puritans are those who want to purify the English church of certain rituals. So they don't want to break away like the separatists. They just want to purify it or make it a little bit better. Now, King Charles I in the early 17th century, he began to target Puritans. He, again, and Puritans wanted to purify the church, not break away. So in 1629, know this name John Winthrop, know him at all costs, a group of English people receive a charter and they eventually settle in Massachusetts Bay. So Puritan beliefs, they believe in predestination, which means that God determines whether you will go to heaven or hell before you are born, and there is nothing that you can do to change it. They also focused on reading the Bible, and this will play a large part in education. He believed that Massachusetts would be a city upon a hill, and you see that this is started is because that it is that important. And this was meant to be a model society for the rest of the world to look up to. It was not literally a city on a hill, but rather figuratively, that they would be this model society for the rest of the world. Church members were the only people that were allowed to vote or hold political office, and the church member requirements were very strict. Usually it meant you had to be white, landowning, male. And they did not extend religious freedom to others. It's very interesting. The Puritans came over here because they wanted religious freedom for themselves, but they did not extend it to others, as we'll see with two different people. Thomas Hooker, he founded Connecticut, and he established the nation's first constitution called the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut. It was a constitution for the colony. Roger Williams, a guy from Massachusetts Bay County, actually buddies with John Winthrop. However, he was an extreme separatist. He wanted, Massachusetts, he wanted the Massachusetts Bay County to completely break away from the church. That was too radical for John Winthrop. He also advocated a separation of church and state and that Native Americans should receive money for their land. So what happens to him? He gets banished to Rhode Island where he founds Rhode Island, where in important thing in Rhode Island, all religions could worship. So unlike Maryland where you had to be Christian, Rhode Island you could be Jewish, any religion that you wanted. Another very important woman from Massachusetts Bay who also gets banished to Rhode Island is Anne Hutchinson. She challenged the power of the clergy and rights for women. She basically said the clergy had no right to be preachers, that people could kind of learn on their own. And she sought to speak up in church. And for women to speak up in church, was that, was that was not a common thing during this time. After her banishment, many churches restricted women's rights further. Okay, let's talk about Native American conflicts. We have the Pequot War, which during this time period, if you ever see a war, it's usually over land. So this is a conflict over land and trade. King Philip's War is fought again over war. Now, King Philip is not a European. He is not British. King Philip was the name for a Native American, Metacom. They called him King Philip. This started over land and lasted for several years, and eventually the, the colonists won, and the Native Americans were severely weakened and were hardly a threat anymore. When we're talking about Carolina, we're going back to the South, and they they had, in at this time, there's just one Carolina, it's not North and South, and they're kind of similar to Maryland. They have a head right system, and there's religious toleration to all Christians. In the northern section of Carolina, that's where the poor farmers were, and they were more isolated. In the South, you see wealthy plantations, they are very aristocratic, and they trade with Barbados, especially sugar, and you will see slavery increase heavily 
in the southern part of Carolina. Now let's go to New York. This originally belonged to the Dutch and there were many different groups there and there was some religious toleration and local governments. New Jersey was a proprietor colony like Maryland and Pennsylvania, which means that one person founded it in order to make money. Now a charter is a group of people to make money. A proprietor is one, a proprietor colony is one person founding it to make money. And in New Jersey, most citizens were small farmers. Same with New York, you had a lot of farming, but it wasn't cash crops like the South. It was more wheat and food. Okay, Quakers. Definitely know the Quakers, know the characteristics of them and where they're located. They believed in an inner light, that each person could have their own religious experience. All people could attain salvation, and they did not believe in predestination. Quakers were one of the few groups where women had many rights in church, and they could become preachers and speak publicly, which was very, very progressive for this time period, so please know that. They were pacifists, which meant they were not in favor of war, and they had no paid clergy. The founder of Pennsylvania was William Penn. Pennsylvania means Penn's Woods, and he founded it as a proprietor colony, again to make money. Like Roger Williams, he paid Native Americans for their land, and Pennsylvania was nicknamed a holy experiment, which meant that they would tolerate many different religious groups and make money at the same time. So the Caribbean is going to have a pretty interesting relationship with the colonies. Sugarcane is by far the most important crop. It is very, very arduous to grow and very labor intensive. So they rely on slave labor and they institute harsh slave codes or laws against slavery. They are a very important trading partner with British North America. They will ship the sugar up and then it will turn into rum and different products in British colonies. We're going to talk about the Spanish in North America. They were a Catholic country, so they favor converting natives to Christianity, and especially in the southwestern part of the present-day United States. They, like the French, enlisted them as trading partners, and they intermarried heavily with the Native Americans. So you see this unique Spanish and Native American culture begin to develop. When we're talking about Georgia, one person that you need to know is James Oglethorpe. He was the founder of Georgia, and it was founded per for two reasons. One, to be a border against the Spanish, which were located in Florida, and also to provide a colony for people who were imprisoned for debt to escape to. It used to be if you were in debt to somebody, you would go to jail. So it became a heaven for debtors and the poor. Originally, he excluded African slavery and Catholics. He wanted to get rid of Catholics because he feared that the Spanish would try to take advantage of them. And he didn't want slavery Africans because he was afraid they would run away. Later on, Georgia began to develop when slavery was introduced, and they instituted plantations modeled after South Carolina. So it becomes a very plantation-heavy colony. When we're talking about the French in North America, we're talking about more of the interior, like present-day Michigan and Ohio. And they also had a beneficial relationship with the natives. Most of it was built on trade. All right, mercantilism is a very important concept. And under this concept, it's the idea that counties exist for the benefit and the wealth of the mother country. I teach in New York State, and many years ago on the global exam, the world history exam, there was this document for a DBQ. And you look here, here could be Britain, the mother country. In each colony, the purpose of them, of the colony, was to be like a servant, to bring things like gold and silver, foodstuffs, raw materials. So the whole idea of mercantilism, the colonies would provide raw materials for the mother country. The Navigation Acts, definitely know this, stated that co the colonists could only trade with England. And the colonists could only ship certain goods called enumerated articles to England. And an example of enumerated article is tobacco. You want to impress the AP writers on an essay? Mention enumerated articles. There were some benefits of the Navigation Acts to the colonists. And one of them, or some of them were shipbuilding blossomed. And you also had a growth of lumber and iron industries, predominantly because of ships. The Dominion of England was instituted by James II. He combined the control of several colonies under this guy, Sir Edmund Andros, and he was not well liked in colonial America. He strictly enforced the Navigation Acts, and many colonists resented him. But we have something called the Glorious Revolution that happens in England, and James II is overthrown, and his daughter, and his son-in-law are installed as joint rulers, William and Mary. The College of William and Mary, the second oldest university in America, is named after these two people. Once they 
jointly share the throne. Andros and the Dominion of England and the colonies were overthrown. He actually, Andros tries to escape the colonies by dressing up as a woman and flee, but he is caught. Maryland and Plymouth are combined together into one colony, Maryland. And as a result of the Glorious Revolution, we have a guy in jail by the name of Jacob Leisler. And in New York, he saw this as an opportunity to try to overthrow the New York leader, Francis Nicholson. He is not successful, but like Bacon's Rebellion, this kind of demonstrates tension between lower class and the wealthy in New York. So what's the impact of the Glorious Revolution? Colonists successfully resisted some English policies. They were able to put their feet down and say, no, no more of this. This is going to play a huge role in the 1760s and 1770s. It also strengthened their belief that England should consider their views. Again, something that will come into play in the 1760s and 1770s. Okay, we're going to finish up with some past essay topics that have appeared on your a on AP exams that relate to this chapter. Hopefully after reviewing this chapter, you'll be able to at least have a pretty good uh, idea of what you could incorporate here. All right, that's it for me. Thank you very much for watching. I appreciate it. Please take a moment and subscribe to my channel. There is an L there. The Twitter is just blocking it. Um, help spread the word. Take 30 seconds to us on Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, anything you can think of. If you have any questions, comments, you need clarifications, throw those in the comment section below. I appreciate you guys watching. Thank you very much and have a good day.